So the goal of this video is to help you get incredible, great quality footage from the GoPro straight out of the camera without needing to edit it later on. In this video, I'm going to show you the best settings for the video mode, the photo mode, the time lapse mode, the night lapse mode, and the time warp mode. So I'm going to go through all of those modes with every single best setting you need to get incredible footage right out of this camera. Now for today's video, I will be showing you all of these settings on the GoPro Hero 10 because this is the newest GoPro camera. However, a lot of these settings will translate to other GoPro cameras. Some of the features available on the 10 as options may not be available on some of the older GoPros. So that is important to keep in mind, but the core settings I'm going to show you today, you can put into any GoPro and get great results. Let's take a look at the video mode settings first. Once you're in video mode, you're gonna to wanna to tap down here at the very bottom. And right here, it really doesn't matter which of these presets you select. That is entirely up to you. For the sake of today's video, I am going to select standard here at the top. We're gonna to click on the edit button. And right away, the first setting we're gonna change is where it says resolution in frames per second. So generally, the clips that you're gonna to wanna to share straight out of the camera, you're gonna to wanna to have those in 4K. 5.3K is not really a standard right now. 5.3K is kind of an odd resolution. Since the point of today's video is a clip that you can share without editing, I recommend selecting 4K. There are use cases where you may want to select 1080p for sharing, but I generally do not recommend 1080p because 1080p is not really getting the best out of this camera. When you do 4K, you're using a lot more of the sensor and you're getting a lot better readout of that full potential of that sensor. So I recommend sticking with 4K. Generally, the frame rate you're gonna wanna use is either 30 or 24. 4K 24 is a personal favorite. I like that 24 frames per second. It has a very cinematic feel and look to it, especially with motion blur. But a lot of folks do use 30 frames per second and that's more of that television standard and GoPro footage looks great with 30 frames per second as well. There are use cases for 60. If you want a lot of frames in there, if you're doing something that's like a lot of fast motion, you may want that, or that motion is better seen by your audience. But generally, you're gonna stick with 60, 30, or 24, with 30 or 24 being most common. You could also do 4K 120. Now, 4K 120, basically the main purpose for that is if you wanna do a slow motion clip. So if you were filming a clip that you don't necessarily wanna edit the color or anything else about later on, but you do still want to be able to slow it down, then you should select 4K 120, cause that's gonna give you a lot of flexibility with slow motion. Next, we're gonna select lens. For lens, I have two recommendations here. Select wide for the lens if you're doing an action scene or a landscape scene, or if you're talking to the camera and as long as you're centered in the frame, select wide because it's going to show more of your surroundings around you. If you have something in your footage that you want to be kept straight, uh, let's say you have trees and you don't want them to look like they're bending with that fisheye effect, or if you're in a city urban environment and you don't want the buildings to have that fisheye either, then select a linear or select a linear with horizon leveling. The linear with horizon leveling is going to give you the best results with linear, provided you're doing something where you want the horizon to stay level. So I do recommend that one. But if you do have something where it doesn't matter if the horizon's level, or you're doing a lot of action, you want your camera to be spinning around, then you could select a linear. The reason I like wide a little bit better than linear for this purpose is because wide is using a little more of the sensor. Linear does introduce a crop to your footage, and that crop is technically not getting a full readout of the sensor like wide or super view would. So, I do recommend not using linear unless you have a really good reason to do so. So in this case, I'm gonna put wide because wide is the preference and wide is gonna give best results most of the time. For hypersmooth, you do want to have it on. However, I recommend just having it set to standard for most things you're gonna be doing. If you're gonna be doing a lot of running or really intense action and you really want it to be smooth, I would put this up too high. 
And then if you really, really need it super smooth because you're doing something that just has tons of motion to it, then you could put Boost. The thing to keep in mind is Boost does introduce some cropping into your footage. So I would not use Boost unless you absolutely need to. I rarely, if ever, have used Boost. In my sample clips here, I'm not using Boost. I'm just using Standard and the motion is great. There's very little of it. And that's the other great thing about Standard for Hypersmooth is Standard keeps a little bit of motion there. So it can almost make your video feel a little more natural, whatever you're doing. Sometimes it's nice having some of that motion there. If the video is too stabilized, it can almost look and feel fake. For scheduled capture, I'm gonna keep that off. For duration, we want no limit. And for hindsight, I generally keep that off. The purpose of hindsight is that your camera is constantly monitoring. And if you happen to miss something, you could hit that. If you had hindsight on, you could hit record and it would go back and record the previous 30 seconds of video. If you put it to 30 seconds or you record the previous 15 seconds. The important thing to note if you have hindsight on is it is going to drain your battery a lot quicker. So I generally just do not keep hindsight on. That's not a super useful feature for me, but if you think it might be useful for you, then you can turn it on. But in the end, it's not going to affect the quality of your footage. For the timer, I'm gonna keep that off. And the zoom, we definitely wanna keep that at one. If you have the zoom set to anything other than one, it's going to do digital zoom and it's gonna reduce the quality of your footage significantly. So I do not recommend doing that. Protein settings are really important here. For bitrate, you wanna make sure that's set to high. For shutter, we're going to keep that set to auto. Auto is going to give us the best results for no edit scenarios. For EV comp, I recommend setting this to negative 0.5. So GoPros are notorious for blowing out highlights a little bit, especially if there's clouds in the sky. And setting that EV comp to negative 0.5, I find gives the best results on most GoPros and especially on the 10. With the 10, GoPro did release a firmware that helped with the highlight clipping issue that the 10 had faced. And it does a pretty good job with that. So. In the past, some of the older GoPros, I did put it to negative one for the UV comp. But in this case, I would recommend negative 0.5 in most use cases. For the white balance, you have a couple options here. You could keep it set to auto, which generally will work out okay for you. But I do find I like to set the white balance to something other than auto, because sometimes if I'm going in and out of different lighting situations, depending on what I'm filming, like if I was going uh, into shadows in the woods and then back out into an open field. I find that the white balance can do some weird stuff sometimes. So generally my go-to white balance for normal outdoor daytime filming is 5,000K. You could also get away with 5,500K and it's gonna give you good results. If you are filming at sunrise or sunset, I do recommend setting this to 6,500K. That's gonna kind of capture that that golden lighting with what's called the golden hour. And that's gonna really bring that out in your footage. So do 6,500K if you're doing sunrise, sunset. But otherwise, put this back to 5,000K for best results. For the ISO min, keep that at 100. The GoPro will default to the lowest possible ISO, getting you the best possible footage, depending on your lighting. And then for the ISO max, set that to 800. 800 is the highest I would ever want to go in the ISO max. Otherwise, you're gonna to start to get a lot of noise in your footage and it's not gonna look good. So if you're using your camera during normal daytime lighting, having the ISO min at 100 and the ISO max at 800 is sufficient. You're not gonna have any problems there. For the sharpness, this one I generally like to keep as low. However, medium is also an acceptable option depending on where you are. If you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of detail in the scene, you can usually get away with medium. But if you're in a place like a forest or someplace where there's lots of leaves and trees and grass, the medium is going to, it's gonna to find too much in the scene to sharpen and it's gonna look kind of bad. So generally I recommend sticking with low. I actually find that low looks best in most of my videos. But medium would probably be good if you're in an urban type environment where you have buildings and people. If you're on a street where there's not a lot of people or something like that, or not a lot of cars and other objects, medium is probably going to work. But in general, I do recommend low here. 
For the color, I like keeping this at vibrant. GoPro has really good color science and it does a really good job when you set it to that vibrant color mode. The saturation is really nice and I like it. Uh, the other mode I would recommend though is natural. If you would like something kind of in between that flat and that vibrant, natural does a pretty good job too. But when I'm doing footage straight out of the camera, I do like the vibrant. I think that gives best results. So for the audio setting here, if you're using the audio out of the GoPro, I recommend keeping raw audio off and then I recommend keeping wind set to auto. And when you have the media mod or an external mic connected, you will see that here under media mod and it will tell you what mic. The good thing is when you have the media mod connected, the GoPro will automatically default to the media mod mic. And then if you plug a microphone into the 3.5 millimeter jack in the media mod, the GoPro will then default to that mic. So the nice thing is the GoPro is really good about telling what the best microphone is when it's connected to it. So it will automatically default to that, which is great. Because there have been times where I forgot to check that and then I found out later on, okay, great. My GoPro defaulted right away to that. So like I said, I highly recommend using at least the media mod because you want that nice audio to go with that nice clip. You don't want to have to edit your audio either since the goal here is no edit footage. So I'm currently using the GoPro Hero 10 on the El Grande selfie stick, which is great. The El Grande gives a lot of that lengthier maneuverability. So it's really ideal for no edit settings because you can do what you need to with this. You can get the camera further away from you or you can get it closer up. It offers a lot of options versus some of the shorter selfie sticks. So I love that about it. And I also have my DJI wireless mic connected here on the side. And the GoPro Hero 10 is also in the media mod. So the external microphone is connected through the media mod. And then I'm wearing the other wireless piece right here. And of course, in this video for the actual settings, I have not edited this at all. This is all footage straight out of the camera. So I'm filming this in 4K, 24 frames per second. And I've got all the settings plugged into it that I show you in this video so that you can see exactly the results you can get for no edit situations. Next, let's look at the photo mode settings. The photo mode is going to have a lot less settings than the video mode did. The GoPro Hero 10 does a shockingly good job with photos out of the camera. I've got a lot of samples I'm gonna show you here where I shot them in wide mode and linear mode just so you can see some of the differences. But this camera, I almost feel like this is one of the more underrated features for it. It actually takes some really good photos and the Hero 10 has more megapixels. You can technically blow up these photos and make them bigger now if you want to. So I do find the photo feature on here very useful. So for photo, you're just gonna click down here at the bottom and then you're gonna pick where it says photo and we're gonna select the edit button right here. So for the photo settings, for the lens, you're gonna have three options technically. You're gonna have wide, linear, or narrow. Don't recommend ever using narrow for the photo. I can't see a real good use case for that. If you want to use narrow, then I would just recommend taking a wider linear photo and then cropping it and editing it later on. But since the point of this is not editing, there are potentially a few use cases for narrow, but as you can see, narrow does a massive crop here. If you compare that to wide, narrow does a huge crop and you're not gonna get the same detail and the same pixel readout as you would with wide or linear. So in general, I do like wide for this mode, especially if you're shooting landscape photos, which you often are going to be with a GoPro. You capture a lot of that scene around your subject and it offers you a lot more creative options too with your photo. But there are some good use cases for linear and that's gonna be again, if you want to not have fisheye in the photo, if you wanna have your line straight, if you have a lot of trees or buildings or other things where It'll just look better to have those straight lines. So either of those I consider a great option. It's gonna purely be what your use case is as to which one you set. But wide is my default, so I'm gonna keep that there. For the output, if you own a Hero 10, you will have Super Photo as an option, and I recommend keeping Super Photo set. This is a mode that automatically selects the best image processing for your shot. And the GoPro is really, really good about this. In all of these photos that I took, I did keep it set to Super Photo, and it looks great with Super Photo. It captured that scene really well, and it looks really good in these photos. But if you don't wanna do Super Photo, you could do HDR, 
An HDR is also a good option, especially if you're doing something like a sunrise or sunset. HDR can be just as good of an option as Superphoto. I would kind of experiment with both of those. Maybe toggle that back and forth and take two pictures so you can later on see which one you like better. But I don't recommend using standard or raw. Raw is gonna be if you wanna edit the photo later on. So raw does give you a lot of detail to work with, but for the purpose of this video, we're not wanting to edit it. So we don't wanna use raw or standard. We want something that's gonna look really good right out of the GoPro. So I'm gonna go back here to super photo. Scheduled capture, we're gonna keep that off. Timer is useful to have on if you're gonna be taking like a picture of yourself or a group and you wanna delay. So you can do three seconds or you can do 10 seconds. So if you've got like a family photo you wanna take with the GoPro, I would do 10 seconds so then you can hit the shutter button and then you can go back and get in that photo before it takes the actual picture. If you're doing like a selfie, then three seconds is probably good. And of course, if you're using your phone or something like the Volta, which I featured in a recent video I've linked to above, as a remote control, then you could keep the timer off or you could still keep it like three seconds, 10 seconds if you wanna hit the button and then have time to hide it from your photo. The zoom, you definitely wanna keep that at 1x. Now, a lot of these settings under ProTune are not even going to be available as an option because of us selecting Super Photo. So shutter is grayed out, not applicable. EV Comp is also grayed out and not applicable. White balance, I simply recommend keeping that set at auto. The GoPro is really good about handling the white balance based on the scene. And when you're doing a photo, it's not gonna be changing on you. It's gonna be captured in that moment in time in the photo. ISO Min is also not applicable. ISO Max is not applicable either. For sharpness, you've got the two options that I recommend. You can either do medium or low. Either one is gonna give you good results, but if you want a little bit more detail in your photo, I recommend sticking with medium. In this case, for photos, I do generally recommend medium. I think it gives the best results. Even if you're in the woods or a field, it's good because it captures enough detail without it being too much. But I do not recommend high. I think high in most cases is too sharp. And I find with low that I think low is almost a little bit too soft in the photo. So for this case, I do recommend medium. And color is also grayed out. So that is not an option when you're doing super photo either. And then the shortcuts down here will not apply. Also, I want to mention if you select HDR for the output, these options down here will also be grayed out. So regardless of whether you do super photo or, H or HDR, you do not have to configure any of these options down here other than the white balance and the sharpness. Next, we're gonna go through the time-lapse settings. And I'm gonna show you the time-lapse first, and then we'll do the night-lapse and the time warp since those are all available under the same mode. For the time-lapse settings, you're gonna to wanna to click right here at the edit button next to time-lapse. And for the resolution, I definitely recommend using 4K. 1080p does not give nearly enough detail in the time-lapse and you're missing out on a lot of great detail by not selecting 4K. So definitely select 4K for your resolution there. If you have a use case where you'd like it to be four by three, more like a photo for your time-lapse, you can select that up there as well. But I do recommend generally just sticking with the 4K 16 by nine as that is the best for sharing. For the lens, I definitely recommend sticking with wide. Wide is gonna be the full sensor readout and it's gonna give you the best results for your time-lapse. I generally don't recommend linear or narrow, but if you do for some reason need those straight lines and no fisheye in it, then linear is okay to choose here as well. It doesn't introduce much of a crop and you still get really good detail. For the format, video is gonna be what you wanna select. This is gonna give you that time-lapse where it pieces together all the individual photos within the camera and gives you a single .mp4 file output at the end. For the interval, I generally recommend five seconds. Five seconds is great if you're gonna have the camera out there shooting for a couple hours, getting you a time-lapse. If for some reason you're gonna have it shooting all day or multiple days, then you probably wanna go up here and maybe have an interval of at least 30 seconds. And if you're shooting for multiple days, like if you have it plugged in and are shooting a long time, 
then you may even want to go up here to an interval like two minutes, five minutes, or 60 minutes. So that would be applicable, like let's say you're shooting a job site where you're building a house or you're excavating for a house. Having an interval like that, where it takes a picture every couple minutes or every hour, could be useful. But if I'm doing a time lapse like I typically do during the day where I'm capturing a landscape with the sky, then five seconds is my go-to default interval. For the scheduled capture, I'm gonna keep that off. For the duration, I'm gonna keep it set to no limit. For the timer, I'm gonna keep that off. And the zoom, I'm gonna keep that at one. Protune settings are really important here for time lapses. You wanna make sure you have the bit rate set to high. You wanna have the EV comp set to negative 0.5. That's gonna be good anytime during the day when you're out there shooting a time lapse. That's gonna help make sure you get all those rich details in the sky and the clouds. And if you're doing a sunset, if you have it set to zero, it's gonna overblow some of those highlights potentially especially if you're looking into the sun. And if you have a set to negative one, I think it's a little bit too dark for that compensation. So on the Hero 10 at least, I like the negative 0.5. For the white balance, in the daytime, I'm generally gonna recommend you keep this at 5,000K or 5,500K. But if you are doing a sunset or a sunrise, put it to 6,500K, you will not be disappointed. That will really bring out a lot of those rich colors that occur that time of day. For the ISO Min, I recommend keeping that set to 100. And for the ISO Max, if you are doing something like a sunrise or a sunset, I recommend setting it to the same as the Min. And the reason for that, it's not gonna go changing the ISO on you, like as it gets darker with the sunset. It's gonna keep it at 100, so you're gonna have that nice gradual fade to black. And that's gonna be a great way to end your sunset time lapse. I recommend for those that you wait until it's completely dark out, before stopping your GoPro. And the same thing with sunrise. If you really wanna capture a great sunrise time lapse, I recommend getting your GoPro out there and set up before the sun starts rising. Ideally when it's still dark. And that's where if you have the ISO set to 100, it's going to gradually get brighter with the natural lighting. It's not gonna be the ISO boosting the brightness. But if you're doing a time lapse during the middle of the day, you also should be fine with the 100 set there. The only exception would be if it's a dark day or a really cloudy overcast day, then you may wanna boost these a little bit to 200 or 400. But for a great quality time-lapse, you want to keep the ISO min and max the same. That is one of those great secrets that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it makes a big difference. You don't want the ISO changing on you in the middle of a time-lapse. It can look really weird and almost cause a flickering sensation in there. For the sharpness, for a good time lapse, I recommend keeping it at medium. You want it to capture a certain amount of detail there without it being too sharp, but you also don't want it to be too soft, which would be the case of low. So I recommend sharpness medium. And then color, I highly recommend vibrant or natural. Vibrant is great if you're doing a sky and clouds or a sunrise and a sunset. So in general, I do recommend vibrant but there are some use cases where you may want to use natural and that's gonna be great as well. I don't recommend flat because the point of this is to have footage not to edit and flat is going to have just too little color present in it. So vibrant is my go-to here. And then the shortcuts down here will not apply. Next, we're gonna take a look at this night lapse mode. So night lapse is gonna be right here below time lapse. We're gonna click edit there. And you will see some options that are grayed out here. So what you need to do for format is you need to change it to video and then the options become available. So for night lapse, the resolution, I definitely recommend 4K. Again, that's gonna be the full sensor readout. You're gonna get the most detail. For format, it of course is gonna be video. For lens, I recommend wide. I don't recommend anything else unless you're doing a night lapse in a city or with a lot of trees around where you don't want the fish eye, in which case you could change this to linear, but we're gonna keep it wide. For interval, you can keep that at auto because the way we're gonna control our interval is through the shutter. Whatever I set the shutter speed here to is what the interval is by default going to be. So if you were filming a night sky and there is a bright full moon in the sky, 
You can put the interval to 15 seconds and that's gonna serve you well. But if you're doing a night sky and it's fully dark, there's no moon, you wanna capture stars in the Milky Way, you want to boost this to 30 seconds because you want that shutter open as long as it can be to capture as much light as possible. You want it to get all the light from those individual stars. So 30 seconds is gonna be your default there. If you've got a sky where maybe it's like a half moon or less and you're facing the moon, you could put this to something like 20 seconds. I find 20 is often one of my go-to intervals here. Uh, 20 seconds is also good if you've got some artificial lighting in there. Like if you live in suburbs or you're close to a city, you may wanna use 20 seconds as well. So it is important to play around with this a bit so that you get a feel for what results you like best. So I'm gonna to go to my default here of 20 seconds. Scheduled capture can be off, duration no limit. Timer, three seconds is great if when you initially start it, you hit the button, it gives you time to get back so there's not uh, the camera shaking after you push the button since it is a night lapse. So I recommend keeping that at three seconds. Zoom, you wanna keep at one. For ProTune, you wanna put the bit rate up to high. We wanna get the highest quality readout. EV Comp will not apply, that'll be grayed out. For the white balance, since it is a night lapse, I generally recommend setting this to somewhere between 3200K and 4000K. Either of those are great. I generally prefer 4000K. I like the lighting and the tones it does in the sky, but 3200K is great as well for a night lapse. For the ISO min, I recommend setting this to either 800 or 1600. I don't recommend going above 1600 to 32. It's gonna have way too much noise. In general, I only recommend going to 1600 if you're doing a fully dark sky where you wanna capture like the Milky Way and a lot of stars. But if you're near a city or in suburbs or you have a lot of artificial lighting in the scene, 800 is generally going to be fine. 800 is also good if you have a bright full moon in the sky. That's gonna also give you good results. And then you wanna make sure your ISO max is set to the same as the ISO min. You don't want your ISO changing on you during a night lapse. It will really throw it off if it does. So you wanna keep that ISO set to the same. For sharpness, I generally recommend keeping that at low for a night lapse. When this GoPro is shooting in low lighting with a smaller sensor, you don't want too much sharpness at nighttime because it's going to lock onto things and it's gonna cause kind of a selective sharpness in your scene and it's not gonna look great. So you generally wanna keep sharpness of low. It helps soften out things a little and it helps it look a little bit better while minimizing some of that noise. And I also recommend keeping color set to natural for a night lapse. Vibrant can do weird stuff, just like with a night photo. It can cause some weird oversaturation. And then if you do flat, I find that has too little color in it. So I like to do the middle of the road and go natural. But if you needed to err on one side or the other of natural, then I would select flat. And then the shortcuts below will not apply. And finally, we're going to take a look at the time warp settings. For time warp, we're gonna select edit right here. So for resolution, once again, I recommend having that set at 4K. It's gonna give you the full readout of the sensor and it's gonna look great. For the lens, I would use either wide or linear. You could also do linear plus horizon leveling if you're in a situation where you wanna keep that horizon extra level. In fact, if you are using linear, I do recommend horizon leveling because it will help your time warp look even smoother. But if you're not using linear, then you wanna have wide up here at the top. I generally prefer wide for this because it captures more of the scene going on around me off to the sides. For the speed, Definitely recommend keeping auto set here. The camera does a great job with time warp on figuring out the speed. For the speed ramp, you're gonna have this option during your time warp where you can select it if you wanna to toggle to real speed for a time during it, and then you can hit it again and it'll go back to the time warp. It's a neat feature. I recommend keeping it available for real speed. You also have the half speed option if you want to, but I recommend doing real speed. Scheduled capture, we wanna have that off. For the duration, we wanna have no limit. You're gonna be in control of how long that goes. 
For the timer, we want that off, and the zoom, we want that at 1x. For the ProTune settings, we want to have that EV comp set to negative 0.5. It's going to give you the best results with the highlights. For the white balance, if you're shooting it during the daytime, you want to have that set to 5000K. If you're shooting it at sunrise or sunset, then you could keep it set to 6500K for best results. For the ISO min, you want to keep that set to 100, and then the ISO max, you want to keep that set at 800. Basically, time warp, we want to treat it more like a video clip than a time lapse. For sharpness, you can put that at low or medium. It's going to depend on where you're filming. Uh, similar to what I mentioned with the video, if you're around a lot of trees and grass, then you may want to keep it set to low. But if you're in a city and there's not a lot of people, there's lots of big buildings, I think medium is gonna look best for you. Color, definitely set that to vibrant. You could also set it to natural, but vibrant is gonna give you those real rich colors and it's gonna look best. And technically, there is sound during a time warp. So for that, if you're gonna use any of the audio from it, I recommend keeping wind set to auto for best results. And then shortcuts down here will not apply. Whether on the trail or off the trail, I always have my Ridge Wallet on me. The Ridge Wallet is much slimmer than my old bulky wallet, and I love it that the Ridge has over 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. This gave me plenty of options to find the wallet that is perfect for me. The Ridge Wallet holds up to 12 cards and offers plenty of room for cash. The durable material means each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. In fact, the Ridge team is so confident that you'll like your wallet, they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. If you don't love it, you can send it back for a full refund. All of these features, along with the more than 40,000 five-star reviews, make the Ridge Wallet the perfect gift for Father's Day. So check out the Ridge Wallet at ridge.com slash great day for a hike and use my exclusive coupon code great day for a hike for 15% off your order.